This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. She said, no, don't worry about it. I had a call from the FA, but there's some people made allegations against you. I said, well, for what? And then she went, well, a racial allegation. I went, oh. I said, all right. And I named four of the players. I said, right, I'll tell you what they are, because now they've got the ump because they're not getting a contract. Best player i ever seen and had the pleasure to talk and, and even train with was Johan Cruyff. If you're an arsehole, you're an arsehole. It doesn't matter, religion, colour, anything, don't come into it in my eyes. You're down in the dump and you want to growl in at everyone because you got sacked. The following season there, you're running around a pitch at Wembley, getting promoted. Because I'd just come out of a bit of a bad situation at Bournemouth. I was a little bit... You know, I had a bit, of, a bit of a breakdown, I think, of, you know, in a nutshell. I was under the hospital and everything. Sky TV, um, two days stuck outside my house. Microphones, cameras. I've been done for segregating a changing room. Won't let blacks change with whites. Won't let blacks eat with whites. How many charges did you actually get? I think there was, originally, there was 28 because that's a lot of charges over Massive. one or two you're thinking you've got a fighting chance there you go so the ones who was threatening to shoot you oh yeah doing all the kinds of is the one who's made the allegations against yeah, you yeah both of them and this is noted down it's not just you no try to Read fire it. shots back and boom we're on and today's guest, we've got football manager, John Yams. Johnny boy, how about you? Me. Yeah, pleased to meet you, James. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, it'd be nice to get out and suddenly hear my side of what's been going on. Yeah, a lot of media headlines. You've got one of the, I think, the biggest ban in FA history. Um, 18 months, they doubled it because of your, your, your appeal. Three years, you've been kind of, we'll call the, called a racist now because of certain comments you've made over the last two or three years. You've been a manager for over 30 years and today's you want to tell things from your side. Um, but first and foremost, how are you? Yeah, I've coming through the worst year of my life, you can imagine. Uh, not only for me, for, for my family, for friends that I know and it's just people that you know that, I wouldn't say know the truth, but you know, you're portrayed as somebody like you're some sort of cartoon character and, you know, this big ogre who goes... It's not me at all, and uh, it's just such a shame that it's come to this with all the people and players that I've worked with and people that I know, friends that I know, and all religions, all creeds that you know, and you've got to sort of like look at them and think, do you think I'm like that? And I know they don't, and I know the evidence will show and things like that that I've got that I don't think it's been very fair, to be honest with you. It's a big card to have hanging over your head, especially in today's society. Um, there was a few charges which we'll touch on you pleaded to a couple you get charged yeah. with a few um, but we'll touch on, on everything but first of all I always go back to the start of my guests get a bit of understanding about you yeah. where you grew up how it all began yeah uh, born in August 1959 even though I don't look that old um, place called Annie McCall's Hospital which was in Stockwell uh, standing joke between me and a couple of my mates uh, Mickey Regan one of them I have to mention him because it's the same bed, same hospital joke. You know, I jumped, my mother jumped out and his mum jumped in sort of thing. It was one of them sort of places. Uh, born, raised South London. Great, great uh, 
times I had round there growing up. Um, council estates moved up to West Norwood. Um, and yeah, just really as a kid, you know, went to a, a Catholic school, secondary school, which I didn't know yeah. racism, sexism or anything like that. You know, that was the days when you had the National Front and things like that. And it was just, a, a, we did, it's horrible to say, but you didn't realise it. It was only when people identified what was going on that as kids, you realised it. You was just all kids growing up. And uh, I loved every minute of it, to be fair. How were you at school? I went to a secondary school in Streatham. Well, Streatham, border of Streatham, biggest Catholic school. And that's first and foremost where it started. Because we was Catholics, it was a time of the IRA and everything was going on. And there was people digging me out because my family, my nan was from travellers and Irish and that. And you're thinking, oh, I didn't know all this was going on, you know. All my mates that we go and knock about with, there was no mention of this, that and the other. Then you see the IRA blowing. Never been to Ireland. I've never been to Ireland in my life, you know. I'm an English boy, born, bred, South London lad. We're all the same. And, uh, yeah, it was quite funny growing up. And, yeah, it, it was an experience, put it that way. I was parents. Um, no, I never got on with the old man. The old man was a bit of an enigma, to be fair. Um, my mum tough woman bought like, one of 13 kids and my nan like I say toughest little woman you'll ever come across little Irish like traveller woman and you you know I've seen her stand there fighting men and fighting people she was just a, but everything everything for the family everything you haven't got nothing but you share it no one's ever better than you all the, all the good things you know please thank you um, no one had a pot to piss in but then so what you know you didn't realise that as a kid it's only when you got older that you started wanting things when did you start playing football I started very young I, I was we used to play for a, a church team me and the chaps St Matthews down in West Norwood uh, played for the school and there was a Scots uh, player Johnny Boyle played at Chelsea what a what a great great man real real nice man and he won the European uh, Cup Winners Cup with Chelsea, and every, and he used to come down and train our school, train the um, the uh, church team with sometimes Aussie, and that used to come down. Uh, Stuart Houston, who went on with Man United, and good good people. But you used to get a lot of pros then. You used to come down and help the kids, you know. And it was great to see these players playing, and, and then all of a sudden you're there with them. But because I weren't a Chelsea fan. <laughs> Um, they used to take the mick out of me because I wouldn't, you know, I'm not a Chelsea man, not, not, no way. And um, it sort of like grew on from there because it was funny, I was reading my birth certificate. When I was born, I was cl- my nan rushed me over, got a priest over because I nearly died of pneumonia. And it was giving me the last rites and everything. And it's all on my birth certificate. And it was a standing joke that, oh, yeah, you've been saved for something. And my nan used to say, yeah, drive everyone up the fucking wall. <laughs> and it, from there, it, it's sort of like, I don't know what it was. You have that little bit of determination in you. And I think that goes back to what it is, it, of the wrongness of things. If you've done something, you hold your hands up. If you get captured, you're stupid. If you do this, do that, then you get your deserves. But... You don't need to be treat treat people how you want to be treated, and all, all the things that you're not supposed to say anymore. The rules of your life. It doesn't mean to say that other people abide by them. Who's the best team you played for? Because I know you were. With, is it Crystal Palace? Mobile? Yeah, I was at Palace. I, I was lucky enough. I'd, I trained there at Palace. I had six months. I had a terrible injury, and um, I played when I was fourteen. We was playing in the National Music League. What's that? We, well, it was funny. My brother used to work at Apple Records. Um, when I was 14 years of age, there I am at a party with him. Um, Ringo Starr, um, Elton John was there. There was a few, like Kenny Everett. And there's me, this 14-year-old, walking around thinking, this is a bit of me, this, you know what I mean? What am I walking around Stratton for when you've got all this little firm going on, you know? And they had a, they had a, a football team from Gaff Management, which was Rod Stewart's manager, and the Bee Gees uh, and all these sort of people. And Robert Stigwood had a team in it, Pink Floyd, and they bought this music in Industries League. And we, I was thought I was getting a few quid for playing. And the lads that I was playing with, our, our, our sort of like captain was a drummer with Rory Gallagher. Um, and now yeah, it was good experience. There I am as a kid now playing with men, proper men. 
and you're going to people and people are going to me, oh, look, there's a fella out of Pink Floyd there and there's the... Well, listen, we was into sort of like all sorts of music, but we was like the reggae music and a bit of the old blue beat and Scar and UB40 weren't about and then show me age now. Fuck's sake, John. We was into the old Desmond Decker and Tighten Up Volume 2 and all that, you know, Prince Buster and all that sort of people. Used to be a shop in Brixton called... Um, I think it was the, the oh, Desmond Zip Bar. And we used to go down there and, you know, get the records down there. Used to be a shop down there. We used to get all your shoes, Harry the Shoe Shop. Because me and good friends of mine used to have stalls and all that around Brixton. It was a proper community. And people go now about Brixton and this, that and the other. Well, we grew up there. You know, was there tension? Was there, listen, you're kids. You don't give a fuck where you are. You know, you treat people the same as you want to be treated. If you if you come across as a bullshitter or a liar, you, you get sorted out by your own people. Um, you know, but great times. Your, your career was cut short with an injury? Yeah. I, I, to be fair, looking back on it, because I was doing, like, I got involved in the men's football very, very early. Loved every minute of it. We used to have a team called Adidas, which was run out of a, a pub in a Western, in a Tulsa Hill. Uh, my auntie had a pub at the Elm Park which we used to run it out of and then we went into this one and the lads in there we had some great players in there like the non-league players Dully Jamblick players like Keith Yours Roger, Roger Chamberlain all these sort of people they, they were good players and um, you loved your football you loved your football and I got more involved in that I was still training playing and when I got injured it was an excuse really was I that good I think I could have been but as soon as I got injured that was me I was on the wild side of life for 10 years, which absolutely loved every minute of it. What age were you when you got injured? I was 17 and I was 18. Just a kid? Just a kid, yeah. And now was the days, my leg, I broke my leg, um, I've done the fibula and the tibia at the time, and I was worrying about the bone cracking, and my knee was shot. And I was in plaster, I think it must have been for about 11 months. They kept changing it below my knee. and I, So from that age, you know, I was fucking fuming all the time because you still think you're going to come back. Luckily, I got offered a deal to go to Millwall. The old manager there used to be the, the manager, uh, the coach of Crystal Palace, George Petchy. And I went there for six months, but great club, great club, great people, but just didn't really cut the mustard, to be quite honest yeah. with you. I'd lost that art of the yard. So it was either that or me mates was on the roofs there in Ashfelton. So there you go, there you go. You're out, you're earning money, you're getting money through, you know, like the other side of football and that. Yeah. Just great times. My well, whoa, I was gutted to never get into the playoffs there. Like, their fans are fucking nuts. Well, you Did still... you feel that then? <laughs> like, they're nuts, aren't they? Well, the thing is, when you, when you know a lot of them and when you ran that way, it's, it's all about your passion for your club, isn't it? You know, it used to be funny. They're, the fans up there, they're some of the best. Every club's got them. But the Millwall ones, mate, they're Millwall, it's like West Ham, some of them, but them sort of teams, mate, it's, it's, your, it's your club, it's your history, it's your, it's your era, it doesn't matter where you are or whatever, you're a Millwall fan or you're a Palace fan or wherever you are, great, great club, but it, it was an environment because we was all at the same, you know, the same environment and then when you go to the non-league sides that we was at Dulwich Hamlet and, and teams like that, you know, I was lucky enough, I went back to Dulwich with Dave Garland as managing it and that's when we took Peter Crouch on loan. We took Crouchy down when he was still at Tottenham. And uh, lo and behold, Crouchy obviously doing well for us, QPR, I think, bought him. And the rest is history. Um, and that's, that's the sort of level and the standards that you was getting then. But you can imagine that environment. There you are at Dully Jamlet, middle of South West, uh, South East. But you know everybody. Everybody, you walk in the pub, you know people. Mm -hmm. You know, you walk anywhere, in the betting shops and things like this. And that's what, leading on to it, as we go on to it in, in later, you can see one of the reasons, one of the accusations against me, or some of them, was a little bit, whoa, hold on a minute, you know. It, it, it's your memory from the past and what the way that you... There was never there was never any, any, any badness towards anybody. Yeah, listen, we weren't all walking around like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. But at the same token, we was good people, you like to think. Everybody you knew was around you. Was, you, you was the boys. You was growing up. You was being, you know, doing so in your wild oats, so to speak. Who was Big Crouchy? Because looking at him, he does not look like a player, but the goals that he used to store, score were world class. Like, how was it looking at him for the first time? What were you thinking? Well, he came in. Dave, we, we sold a player at Tottenham called Dave McEwen. Um, and... A fellow that we knew got him on trial for your Foley and Patsy Holland. Who they said like this is kid blah blah blah, and he just came in the dressing room and he he 
he's just like a young, I think he was only about 17 at the time. But you could see in training and that, he had a lot about him and that. But straight away, I think one of the comments one of the players said to him was, you know, because of the size of his feet, and they fucking feet or scaffold balls, you know. And straight away, Crouchy's him. But top, real, real nice fella. And you could see he was determined. And I, I think seeing him where he was, he must have looked around and thought, what the fuck am I doing here? And it gave him the kick. Uh, hopefully, you'd like to think it helped him to get on to where he is. But all credit to him, he could have gone the other way. When you get released or might be released by clubs, you take it two ways, don't you? You either sit back and try and sue everybody or you get on with it. Mm-hmm. So you were in the managerial career for over 30 years, like a long time. How many teams were you involved in, John? Well, what happened in the 80s, before that, I went overseas. I was overseas. I was lucky enough we went working. Um, and I grew up in the 80s in Mallorca. Um, I was there a few weeks ago. Yeah, Beautiful. in a place called Aranal. We used to use a bar called the Flying Agus, which was it was the best growing up land that you could ever have. All the lads there. There was, you know, talk about abuse and racism. Right? When you've got a bar full of Scotsmen singing Bonnie Paraguay at you, when England are playing him in 1980, great times. But it was all done in good humour. And you meet people and you see different people and you, you, you grow up and you see things. Went to Australia and... Um, in the Middle East I went out working in Egypt and that's where I first got into coaching to be honest I was out in Egypt Cairo and whoa, you know there's a little kid from South London what are you doing in middle of Cairo and I started coaching out there with a lot of the Muslim boys and, and you know there was a club formed out there called um, Somalik which I'd done a bit of coaching for a big club out there and I came back from there went out to Oman was working out there Came back, went to the, the Agus again out with, the, with the boys, and we decided a few of us there to go to Australia, where I played out in Australia, but I was nowhere near it. It was just another excuse to. And I got into my coaching and came back to England, met my now wife, but was so, so lucky, so lucky that I got a job offered in 1990 at Fulham. A, a fellow called Tom Enifer, who was, he's had a checker past Tom, but what a character. He was the commercial manager there. And he, he could make a pound, you know, you, you come in here now and he'd sell you something. He's one of them, Tom. But great, great, great football man. And I was so, so lucky there that I got, obviously got wrapped around Ray Lewington and Terry Bullivant. And I started doing the youth team and that there. And I was doing a lot of the centres in in central London because, I would, you know, I've always worked in Brixton, in the youth clubs, um, in, in, in and around Stratham, in and around, you know, just to learn your trade. You had to get out on the streets. There's none of this, oh, you know, I'm going to pay and go on a coaching course and I'm going to manage Man United and win the world. You had to get out and earn it and learn it. So see, when you were working back then all these years ago, was there any allegations made against you then? Only what a good looking geezer. No, none. Well, there wasn't. I don't think you, 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 you there was never any, all through your life, we was brought up with the, with, the, with the attitude, it doesn't matter where you're from or what you are. If you're a best player, or you, you are the best at what you want to be, why wouldn't you get picked? Why wouldn't you do this? Why would, If you're an arsehole, you're an arsehole. It doesn't matter, religion, colour, anything, don't come into it in my eyes. And it, if you sort of like lead them through your, you go back to your, 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 your roots of no one's better than you, no one's this, no one's that, it's the truth. You know, you're, not, you're not out to make allegations against people. And people, you, if there was anything whether it was an allegation about you looking at someone's girlfriend or they're looking at your girlfriend or whatever it was, then it was sorted. It was sorted between you and him as a man or as a whatever you want to call it. Not, you know, not just me, players and anything. I've seen loads of things happen. But no, never, 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 never in, in, in a million years. You wouldn't think about that back then. Who's the best team you worked with? Um, I would say the best team that we progressed with was obviously at Bournemouth. But Exeter was a great time for me uh, with Paul Tisdale. Uh, I was Paul's assistant when we won the two promotions. What a great man. You know, he, he's done, he's stuck by everything. You know, Paul, I speak to him regular Stevie Perriman. You know, see Steve, you're working with Steve Perriman. It's Tottenham legends, you know. And if you can't learn off of these people, but Malcolm Allison, and that was my, my favourite coach of all time. He was just a different, different kettle of fish to everybody. Years and years above himself, Malcolm. And he could tell some stories as well. What makes a good manager? To me, I think you've got to be able, if, if you can't stop being yourself, it's just you've got to re- your relationship with people. 
You've got to be able to talk to people. You've got to be able to listen to people. You've got to be able to have a little bit of empathy with someone, my opinion. And at the end of the day, uh, you've got to be able to relate. People have got to relate to you, good or bad. Nine times out of ten, you're giving people good news. And that one time you've got to give them bad news, you hope that it's coming out the same heart, the same lungs, the same brain as what you're giving them the good news with. Is there nerves coming picking a team? knowing that you have to drop players for big games or do you uh, become so cold towards that yeah well there is but then you get your assistant to do that mm-hmm. uh, there is but then like I say you pick your best team you try and pick your best team and your best team is the one that because it reflects if the team does well you do well the fans do well if, if you don't and, you, and you're sort of like picking people purely out of spite or I'm not going to pick him because a lot of it, at the levels I've worked at as well, a lot of it's down to money anyway. You've got no option but to pick them. So you've got to get the best out of, because we've produced quite a few players. You know, I've worked with some players that have gone on with big, big money uh, who have started with nothing. And, and you think to yourself, you know what? Everybody needs an opportunity. Everybody, I'm one of them. You come down and earn the right to get in the team. I'll give you the opportunity. Um, and we did and I have done over the years and it's worked successfully for me I went for a stage I think every did in, in the 90s I think I got a little bit too look at me I ain't not you know I'm fucking Billy Big Boots now there you are Mallorca's and all that lot and you, and you learn very quickly and you get shot down very quickly that hold on you're only as good as your last game you, you, you go against what you stand for you know I was, I was boozing a lot then and all that and I must have been an obnoxious, horrible bastard. But the Scottish managers always have produced some of the, the best managers the world's ever seen. That like, do you think there's an element of fear with the Scottish managers? I've kind of got that because Alex Ferguson, that like, he was, you can tell the players were fear, fearful of him, but they could tell you could respect him. Is that a big part of it? Having a little element of fear because some, I think the man you over the last few years, the, the dressing rooms kind of went soft. Some of the players dancing about, making TikTok videos. For me, I'm against all that shit. That like, mm-hmm. it's just embarrassing. You're to play football and do things in your in your own fucking time but not in dressing rooms like did you see the Scottish managers having that extra little bit of well like I say getting back to my Aggies days uh, Scottish managers you know you, you wouldn't think that football was played anywhere but outside Scotland but back in the day every, every team had an, had an odd Scotsman in it you know they had someone who was down there you knew that the jock was going to go in there he was going to have a go for you he was going to do this for you and you had that little bit I think that was all coming down to my old granddad used to say Scotsman everyone thinks Scotsman they're tough these tough hard you know uh, he says because you can't understand them <laughs> and he said anyone shouts and anyone shouts and screams at you your first thought is whoa hold on a minute he said so calm yourself down and then listen to what he said then you'll be alright it's a fact you know, but Terry Erlock and that, who was who went up to Rangers, Rangers he was that. a dirty bastard. Good player. He was a full of I remember oh, some of the tackles player. he used to put in in the Celtic <laughs> Rangers games. Yes, well, that's why. Was he at Millwall? He was at Millwall, yeah. Yeah, Millwall legend. But he yeah. came to Fulham. He was at Fulham with me as well. When soon we as soon as Billy Bremner's, you go through them. You know, like. And everyone had that, but that was the spirit of the club. You know, you 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 know, you had you had the jocks. You had, well, you're not allowed to say that anymore. I'm frightened. You know, I'm. If I sound nervy, that's why, because you're thinking, I can't say jock. You can't say this, and I don't mean that in in a stupid way. But you could turn around. Now I could be waiting tomorrow, and it could be a bloody writ on me doorstep that you call James English a jock well you know that's a compliment of what he normally gets called <laughs> but well, this is a society we're in that <clears throat> people are on eggshells people are getting cancelled left right and centre listen we'll get into all the allegations and that in a bit but it's um, when you're going through your career then and who's like you worked with Eddie Howe and that as well like, he's flying high at Newcastle like, how was he as a manager Eddie? listen Ed, we got, uh, Ed came back with us to Bournemouth um, we had some great times, me and my Jason, when we first went in there, because that's all there was at Bournemouth. And we built up a side that was in the first division and wound up in the Premier League. Um, me personally, as we was growing higher and higher, you know, Ed, Ed, Ed's a, a younger manager. Um, and the technology and all this come out and, you know, I used to make them laugh. I just sit there and these machines and that and you know not for me computers and this and psychologists and everything else I'm not saying it's not needed but any knowledge is good knowledge if it's used properly and Ned's very very good at what he does um, generational wise as a person and everything else we used to we used to go out together and yeah, we had, I was like the old granddad with him it was a bit like fools and horses 
you know, I should sit there with me war stories and Ed and Jason and that, but good people. And we had some great players, you know, I bought Cullen Wilson, uh, Matt Ritchie, you know, all them people come and made a massive, massive difference to the club. Um, and it were great times there because it was all on the up. Um, but sometimes I think when the money started getting involved, you definitely see the changes in people. And you see the changes in the players that you're buying and you see the difference, that little bit of, I wouldn't say hunger goes out the window, but you, you start looking, one minute you're looking in, a, in, in like a Lidl's and then all of a sudden you're shopping in Harrods. Well, it's a different kind of market, isn't it, you know? And and I don't know. I, I, I like the lower levels. I like the lower meat and gravy. It's a bit more realistic to me. Who's the best player you've ever seen? Best player i ever seen and had the pleasure to talk and, and even train with was Johan Cruyff great when I back in the day he came over with um, he was playing for the New York Cosmos in an exhibition match at Chelsea and he come down to the training ground where we were and mate he was because they wanted somewhere to train and mate what a nice man all I remember he used to smoke like a chimney smoke 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 all the time but we, he was one of the first we played football golf with him and he was pinging the ball. Are you boys? Are, yeah, boom, boom. And I'm trying to do a Dutch accent. But he's pinging the ball, he's pinging the ball. And we go, yeah, easy, that. What's he, who's this guy? He's, well, he's doing it with his other foot. Then he's doing it with it. And then you must break. Great man. Talk football. Malcolm Allison, once again, he had very big influence on the Dutch. He loved Dutch football, Malcolm. And he had great influence on, on that sort of side of him. And when you see now that you've got Pep and all that talk well of Johan, it... To me, that all comes back down to a little bit with Malcolm. See, the Dutch way, Ajax, like they brought all oh. the youth players through, but now they're doing it with, is it Alkmaar? They've got yeah. what they've done now is brain tests. If oh, you don't right. pass the brain test, you don't get in, but they've just won the Champions League, youth Champions League or UEFA Cup there, scored 18 goals, only conceded two, battered Real Madrid and Barcelona. So you know yourself, football brain, yeah, yeah, how yeah. many players have you seen with yeah. talent, but their brain, you're thinking, you're a fucking donkey, man. Like, <laughs> so they're doing brain tests now. It's like you say, it's technology in the future, probably you yeah. not like, but they are, apparently the Dutch football is going to be booming again for the next 20 years because oh, they're ahead of times. They're doing tests on the brain, how they would react to situations. <laughs> some of the lads and some of the people I've worked with would have straight away, that, that's them failed. You wouldn't get, you wouldn't get a fucking job. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. That's what you've got to do. But you know, you, you have to go, like I say, when we're working in the youth clubs where you're looking for players. You're looking for players all the time. You're out looking in the streets. It used to be the old, you know, get out of ghetto, it was boxing and football. I think we've lost that a little bit now. I think people expect too much. And I think, you know, if you're not playing on a on a pitch that's cut to half a millimetre or all weather and all this, well, you don't, we used to be out in the streets. You know, here I go again on the old time, but it's a fact. You was out on the streets playing and you was out on the streets doing this. And like I say, I was playing with seniors. I was playing with older boys because they were the bigger boys, you know, and half of them, they, you know, right, a little handfuls as well afterwards, but you get the ball out. It was, I don't think it is anymore, James, to mm -hmm. be honest. But football was becoming a middle class kind of sport, man. Now, back in the day, with myself in the 80s and that, we yeah, had yeah. holes in our boots, little plastic bag. That's what I'm saying. Away down, playing four games yeah. at the weekend. And yeah, yeah. That's all we had. Now kids are mental health through the roof ADHD yeah, through yeah, the yeah. roof like you've got iPads laptops social media only thing they do now is watch football and a lot of the football pitches in Glasgow half of them are away probably 80% of them are away yeah. it's sad that like, I, I, I would I'd probably see a lot of teams going into administration now and only having maybe one or two leagues in Scotland because nobody goes and watches games anymore no nah. now well I think that look, exactly the same and, and you, you look at it what we've gone through as a generation or as everything else it used to be a privilege to play football because everybody could do it you put like you say you put two bags there and you put this there but I, I just think we've gone a little bit OTT you, you say about you know players wanting this and wanting that is it good I don't think it is well, everybody wanted it but you had to earn it and I think back then it was a lot more emphasis placed on you earn it not you're entitled to it mm -hmm. you know and, and I've had my mental health problems and, and anybody where that comes into I feel sorry for anybody don't get me wrong but if the social workers would have come around our flats where we was growing up I'm telling you now we would have all been locked up we would have all had case workers we would have all the mums and dads would have been in prison blah 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 because you look at it now you leave your door open or you, we had so many uncles and aunties because everybody was your uncle and auntie, because of any trouble, you go around their house. 
I don't think that happens anymore now. It's, it's a little bit closed and we all got to look all over our shoulders. Well, what can we get? What, what are we entitled to? Yeah. Whereas there, if you lent someone a shilling and the next day they didn't lend you a shilling, if they had two of them, well, you wouldn't talk to them anymore. That was them sort of like ostracised. Mm-hmm. And I mean that, as a, as a, but it was it's true. It's, it's a fact. And I think that brought people together a lot more and the trust in issue. Of course, there was always arseholes. There's arseholes everywhere. But the trust issue back then, I think, as kids, you you had to trust people a lot more, and and you yeah. give it out a bit more. But people would earn the trust. Back That's what then, I'm saying. Different, like, like you say, leaving doors open and windows yeah. open. I grew up in a rough area, so yeah. but everybody was out playing. Everybody, yeah. like, we used to go and get pieces of butter and pieces of jam, and that was a luxury for us back then. Going yeah. to somebody's house and getting a piece yeah, of yeah. jam or a piece of butter. Yeah, yeah. Like, That's called a sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's just, it's just. Times have changed. changed. Like I say, we're going through a generation where I look at kids and I think, man, I don't know how you're going to survive life. Life ain't easy. No. It's a fucking tough old slog, no. man. And we're, we're raising a generation of weak, weak fucking links. And that's this, that's the scary thing. There's people out there and you think, yeah, maybe they've got it together. But there's so many people struggling from not just kids now, it's people my age your age that yeah. people are, I don't even know what the ingredient is why it's no. causing so much pain in people's life I totally agree and, and and I look at it now like you say about you know growing up and in, in your life I've, I've I, I wouldn't wish or, or, or have anything on people with my, my, my dad getting back into the day they've registered he was a schizophrenic and the nurse used to come around and have to jab him up and you can imagine our life as kids and my mother's life was off oh, and so I've, I was brought up with that. And, and, and you look back on things sometimes and you do, you rely on your mates. And it was a toss up. You took your paths, didn't you, when you was back then? You know the people that went on the dark side, you know the people that thought they could go on the dark side. Or you was, I was lucky without football and without meeting my missus when I did, who knows where I could have been? I could have been in a bleeding ditch somewhere. You could have been, I don't know. A, a drunk you could have been anything that you you know but you need something to focus on and you've got to get away from that and if it's football if it's a girl if it's moving away if it's this I was so lucky to travel and get away when I did but no one helped me get away it's just I thought I've got to get more out of life than this I've got to go like I say you get a phone call on a Thursday do you want to come and work in Egypt next week uh, yeah go on then Egypt my mother come home she's like fucking, where fucking Egypt you don't know where Egypt was you know, she thought, there I am. So I took a chance. It's like, and I never had a pot to piss in when you land there. You take, there don't seem to be that many risk takers now. Everybody seems to want it. Well, let's study your path, James. I want you to do, and if this happens, oh, it won't happen. You'll get help for that. You know, you know, you, you look tired today. Have you been eating the right beetroot? And all? fucking go and enjoy your life. Get out, get out and enjoy yourself. What year did you go to Crawley? I first, I, twice I've been at Crawley. I went to Crawley the first time when they was in administration with the owners. The, the Chas Majid was the owner then, who he's very, very well um, documented what happened to him and his, his family. But a great man, great man, Chas. I know people, he's got his enemies. Um, I went there with Johnny Ollins, who was the Chelsea manager. He used to be, play for Chelsea and Arsenal. And John took me in to do the kids at first and John got the sack and I took over the first team. We was 10 points adrift at the beginning of the season in administration. Um, Odds on to go down and we stayed up. And Danny Ballman was, we signed Danny, he was a club legend in there. So that that season we survived and uh, I was rewarded with the sack. Once again, so here we go about the ups and downs of it. So what do you do? You know, everyone was a bastard. You know, we fucking all late me and all. Right, but didn't want me there. Could bought someone else in. They got promoted. Steve Evans done a great job there. Done what he had to do. Got them promoted. New owners knew this. So what do I do? Well, I went to Exeter. And that year at Exeter, we got promotion. We got promoted from the uh, Vauxhall, well, it used to be the, the Nation, Nation um, what do they call it? Conference. Conference. We got through the conference. We won the playoffs at Wembley. First, great time that was. Here you are. One minute you're down in the dump and you want to growl in at everyone because you got sacked. The following season, there you are running around a pitch at Wembley, getting promoted. We then got promoted the following year as well with with Exeter. Um, looking back at Exeter, I should have stayed there. I should have stayed with Paul. But once again, I think I got a little bit Charlie Bananas. You know, look at me. And it was a long drive to go to Exeter. Great people down there. 
great, great people. They, it's nice they, down there as well. Yeah. What I used to, I used to go to the, because um, I used to do a lot on their, um, like, like this, it was the uh, Kellogg show, it was called. Great two people, great, well, well above themselves. Great little radio show they used to do. And I used to sit there and I was a little bit like the, uh, the London, the Londoner sort of like come down to Exeter and, you know, like a little bit, ooh, give him one of them. And I used to sit there talking to people and we're sitting, laughing and joking. And regular, they used to say, I ain't got a fucking clue what you're talking about, boy. And all that, uh, what are you talking about? And you, 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 you know, they're from Exeter and I'm from London. Who oh, gives them monkeys? You was all together having a laugh, having a joke. Great, great little football club. Great little football club. And uh, oh, I don't know where I went. Oh, I went to Torquay after that. Took a boy down there, Eunan O'Kane, who went on, he was our first signing at Bournemouth, went on to play for um, Leeds, Republic of Ireland International. So we've, it's always been about, football's all about players, in my opinion. You know, there's no such thing as going to a bad game. You go to a game and someone catches your eye, it's been worthwhile, isn't it? If you go there and, and, and you, you think, oh, what am I going here for? What a waste of time? What a waste of time watching this? Ooh, it's your job. You what, get... what was it like winning at Wembley? It was so funny because Jason Tyndall, who's now Eddie's assistant, was the assistant or the coach at Cambridge. We beat Cambridge United. And and it was so funny. The story, it's a funny story. My mate, he's had a couple of restaurants in Orsham, little Italian boy, Freddie, um, with his Maltese. And we're one nil up, and it's you know I'd only been at Exeter for three or four months, but a great bunch of lads. We had a great team, and they all went on to do higher things. And there you are at Wembley, packed end of Exeter supporters, and Cambridge bought a lot. And we go one nil up. Rob Edwards, Ed, well, like, we're up, and Tizzy's are not very articulate, and me and Steve, you know, giving it all that sort of thing. And uh, last minute of the game, a couple of minutes, Dean Moxie's all the way through, and he looks like oh, God, I think it was Dean. He's going to get the second goal. We're two 0 We're away then. We're here. We're up with a fair right. And he said the keeper comes out and he misses the shot. And all I've heard from my family bit. <sighs> oh, what the fuck's going on? I've looked up and Freddie's there clapping. So what's he doing, you silly bastard? Like oh, they're going, hit an hundred quid on us to win one <laughs> and, the, and the first goal scorer. <laughs> so he'd won a couple of grand. He was happy as a big as shit. Like everyone get the drinks in. But Ray Ray was a. Um, he, Ted Baker's used to sponsor us and Ray was there and Russell Osman was there then. Great time. Great, great, great time. And uh, you couldn't believe it. There am I sitting there at Wembley and fucking... It meant it means a lot, you know. When I, was, when I used to go to the grounds in the Premier League and that and you're sitting there and deep down, this is the little kid from South London who you was lucky. I nearly got a ball stall when I was younger. Escaped that. My mates got locked up. I wasn't there. Long story. I missed that. Got nicked a couple of times with silly things. And I'm there. I am. <sighs> Fucking no. I'm at Wembley. And we've won. And it all comes back. It all comes back. And you, you think of silly things. I was thinking of me nan, and, you know, and me mum and all these people. And, and it's an achievement. You've won at Wembley. You know, you can't, you wouldn't be able to change that. So you got two promotions with Exeter. Why did you leave? Um, Money. No, I, I was travelling a lot and Tiz wanted me to do something different. And like I say, I, I think I got a little bit too big with my boots, to be quite honest with you. Yeah. It's only looking back on it, you know, I wanted this and I wanted to do that and wanted to do a bit more. Um, silly, really, but you live and learn, don't you? And mm -hmm. I, as I say, I went to Torquay after that with Paul Buckle. Um, and it was even further to travel. It made you laugh because they put in a paper, oh, John's left the club, we thank him, blah, blah, blah. He was fed up with the travelling. A week later there, John signed a visit to Torquay, 40, 50 miles further. But no, it, I think that that's what I'm, I like to think sometimes, that I'm good at that. You look at yourself, and I don't blame other people for a lot of things. At the time, everyone's a bastard, you know, you want to eat everybody and all that. But you've got to look at yourself sometimes. If you don't manage yourself and look at yourself and check yourself sometimes, good or bad, you're never going to improve. You'll just wind up being an arsehole. Mm -hmm. So you get released from Crawley and then you went back a few years later? Yeah, went back. Why did they take you back? Um, it was weird because we, I left Bournemouth. I went to Bournemouth. We had success. I always used to go to Crawley because I lived 10 minutes from there. And um, we went into Crawley um, and the, the owner at the time, they was Turkish owners, um, and be previous to this, a fr good friend of mine, Dermot Drummy, was the manager there who had problems, bless him. And, uh, you know, 
he, uh, well, he's not with us anymore, put it that way. And me and Dermot used to talk every day and, and, and it was left a bit of stain on there, but I still, still used to go to the games and that and they put another manager in after Derm and this, that and the other. Um, and I was going to the games, talking to the Turkish owners and we used to have a laugh and have a joke and there was me again, like sitting there, Premier League and all that. At the blue, just before Christmas, I got a phone call. Um, would I come, would I consider being a manager? A couple of the players had stuck my name up. They got rid of the the, uh, the manager then, uh, uh, I forget his name now, Mr. Coffey, I think it was or something. But they got rid of him and, and I said, well, you want me to be manager? I thought, never, never entered me head. It was true, I never entered me head a managing crawler. I'd like to have done because it's 10 minutes from my house. So I went down and I said, okay, let's have a little look and went down and everybody's faces was on the ground and they were struggling a little bit. And uh, I took Lee Bradbury with us, me and Lee Bradbury, played Man City, Palace, good man, Lee, ex, ex squaddy. So we had him, we had a physio, we had, it, it was going to Bournemouth where we had everything coming in. It's back to your roots where you had to be, in, this is the thing, you had to have that atmosphere, you had to get everybody together because if you didn't, you got nothing. You're absolutely nothing. You know, you're not in it. Of course, everyone's in it for the money and get in, but I always think that you're in it. You incentivize. You incentivize your reward success. You don't reward failure. And unfortunately, that's the world, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So we got it going and we um, got, gone to January and we, we was doing really well. And they said to me, because I, I wouldn't sign a contract. I said, I'll, I'll give it till January. Let's see how it goes. Because I thought, if I don't get on with you and you don't get on with me, I'm not going down this road again. Because I'd just come out of a bit of a bad situation at Bournemouth. I was a little bit, you know, I had a bit, a, a bit of a breakdown, I think, uh, you know, in a nutshell. I was under the hospital and everything. And uh, I thought, do I need all this ag again? But I absolutely loved it. Is that the pressure with football that makes your mind go? I think or half was of that it. a bit of your dad on you? Everything, yeah, you you look at all that, you know, and people forget that. they. Everybody goes on about mental health and that. And when you look how we was brought up, and it, it's not... It, it's like when we used to look at the old boys and, and you send them over a glass of scotch or something, you know, when I was 18, 19, they're the boys. They, forget, they went through wars. What was they sitting? And you used to think, silly old boy. They're sitting there thinking, what did they went through? Everyone's got a story, haven't they? Everyone's yeah. got a book in them. So when you look at it, you don't judge any. I don't judge anybody until you get to know the person. And the worst thing people can ever say to you, in my opinion, is I know you feel. Well, you don't know how I feel because you'll react differently to what I do. You might be able to help me with a situation. So anyway, we, we was in Bournemouth and there was Lee and there was me and we, we obviously January come and I said, come on then, I'll sign a deal. We'll get you going for two years. So we was doing really well, signed the deals, had a laugh and a joke with the, with the Turks and all over, like, all coming over from Turkey and all of a sudden we're going to win the European Cup. I go, for fuck's sake, we've only been here 10 minutes. Anyway, had a great time. Then the COVID hit and everything was bosh. And that, to me, what, what's happened at COVID within sport as well, I, I, I don't think we've seen the repercussions of it, to be fair, if that's a word. It, it really hit the club badly. Because one minute, I'll never forget it, I think it was the Grand National was on, and then Liverpool played main, um, uh, played a game at Anfield, and everyone's going, no, football will be all right, football will be all right. Pew, chopped your legs off, there's no football. What do you do? What's going to happen? Well, my missus was working, and she was worked in a care home, administrating the care home at the time, and they had four or five people in the place was dying, and she was coming home of a night, she shot the button up, What's going on? And my boy who was in the army, he'd left the army, he was at home then. And everybody was just, you know, zombified. And I'm thinking, what's going to? I was going down the club every day because we're still trying to, you know, keep... Because you couldn't get the players in. And I officially, we was having all the tests done every day. And, and it was so, so weird. So we missed out. We, we could have gone on and kicked on that year, possibly. I don't know. But we knew I was geared up. We made some good signings that summer. Um, got some good friends of mine that I bought in senior players. And through the COVID, we were still playing. You know, once, once it kicked off again in, in the next season, and we were just flying. We was, we, uh, say, we beat, we had Leeds United in the FA Cup. We beat Leeds 3 0 on the BBC, you know, top sides and all that. And it's me and their manager. And we're like, and people, and I used to do these, these interviews. And people used to go, used to go viral. 
people will have your interviews going, but what the hell does that mean? What have I done now? You know, they always, what have I done now? Oh, you've got to not be so truthful. Oh, you've got to be... Listen, don't ask me then. Don't, if you don't want to hear, don't, don't ask me. But it was all a joke. It was all to get the, get the atmosphere, get the pressure off the boys, get it onto me. And we, we, we were sailing. We bought a boy, I bought a boy in uh, called Max Watters, the uh, top lad, real top lad. In our level, you imagine it, he came in for three months and within the three months, we'd sold him for a million pounds at our level through COVID. And everyone's going, what the hell? Well, it cost us going up, to be honest. Max, what a great kid, went sold him to Cardiff. And we had another one that left as well. That we saw. So we're getting this, the players' levels, because I'm getting phone calls from everybody. You know, Ian Holloway was sending players in, you know, top man, Ollie, and all these people. And I don't know whether it was that year or the year after that the, the Turks was getting the ump and the new owners come in. And, uh, well... After Christmas, that, that, that we had, we had the Christmas, and then after that, it was like the uh, house of cards fell in on me. It was just crazy. See, when you're a manager, how much have you got to say bringing players in? Uh, with me and Erdan, he always had the last say because he does the the wages. But there's certain players that I, if I wanted, that, that I'd have. The thing being, at our level, if they're not going to be good, you know, four hundred pound a week for a player is. To me, it's four hundred pound a week. You've you've got to justify that. Now, to some people, can't live on four hundred. But when when you've come from the Premier League, when they're on forties and fifty grand, but you know that you've got to work on a budget of X amount. Well, you know sometimes you're balancing up apples and pears. But that four hundred quid over the year could send your club cruelly. Three of them could send the club skin because you're over budget. So you've got to make sure that the players you've got in are going to be worth their while to you. Even if it's for four, five games, six games, whatever, they've got to be worth your while. That was good. I enjoyed that side of it because you was getting young, hungry gits in there to play with you. What's the wage budget at Bournemouth? Oh, it went through the roof when we was in the Premier League. Um, I didn't know, to be fair. I, I stayed well away from that. I was, oh, you know, we had the Russian owner oh. there then. Who was a, See, when you're going from Premiership to Crawley, back to it, yeah. like... How's the players different? Obviously, players, some of them think they're barely big balls. Like, did you see that at Crawley as well? Is everybody quite humble because they know where they're playing? Crawley, I think, because I, I, I knew a lot of the lads that I was bringing in. And we didn't, and it was a great atmosphere there. You know, we, we wouldn't have had that success without being a United Football Club. End of story. To come through COVID, to everybody sticking together. You know, you're turning up at COVID, you can only have four in a car. You can only have four in the training ground. And you could only have four, and you, and you're thinking we're going to hotels, and we're the only ones there. It was like Bates's motel, you know. You think it's what the fucking hell was massive hotels, and you, you everybody's like feeding your things, standing well away from you, and we got to go out the next day and play football, and we did, and we was got, and we had players coming down with COVID, terrible. We had some real bad ones, and and you just look, you think when's it all going to end? And you, you look, look at the Premier League and you're thinking, well, if I was on 50, 60, 70 grand a week still, and our players, they never once never got paid. Um, the Turks looked after them, every one of them. Um, I think they was on the furlough for a while as well. But, mate, terrible experience, but a good one. When you look back on it, major, you had to be strong for everybody. And I know that sounds really pathetic, but you did. So how long when all the charges started coming through? Well... Because obviously racism is a massive thing oh. now, obviously. And once you get tired with that brush, you're kind of, everything's, yeah. you're kind of fucked, do you know what I mean? But So, we, so being in the industry for over 30 years, yeah. never any charges, never Not any allegations. A never a thing. So when did that all come on top of you? When did the black clouds come over your head and start kind of? Well, it was a weird one because we had new owners. And these new owners, the Turks wanted to sell, bless them. And it was to and fro in, and he didn't want to, then he did want to, because we was that close. I, I, I honestly believe with the squad that we got and the players that we had, we was ready to kick on. We finished the first season 12th, which is the highest the club's ever ever been in the football league history, other than getting promoted. Uh, beat Leeds, beat, you know, we, we got, I knew, I knew one or two additions we would do it. The following season, it, when all this piped up, I knew that we had eight or nine players that would win the league next year. So anyway, these Americans coming in, promising this, hey, Johnny, do they all crypto people? No, listen, 
I don't think I've done myself a lot of favours with them, to be honest, when they was on about crypto and crypto. And I said, I thought that was the thing that killed Superman. <laughs> and they're looking and they're going, well, you, you, you know, over my head. Kryptonite. I, I, yeah, kryptonite. No. I said, I don't want to know it. You know, I said, I'm not interested. Little figures with pictures on it's worth 30 grand. Well, give me five grand in my pocket and that'll do me. You know, you can have that then. And all these little, and I'm not saying that that was good, bad. It's the modern world. Everyone keeps, because a few of the lads straight away jumped on it, and they? Yeah, Gaffer, Gaffer, you're going to do, fuck off, crypto, because we also have little things going with the players and that, the players ball, um, and all these sorts of things. And then they started a couple, they, they came over, then they didn't come over, then they did, and we were meeting there, Johnny, I five in it, and all that. And having, I lived and worked in America, I forgot to tell you that, I was over there in Sarasota and I was coaching over, I played over there. And uh, I, I half knew, you know, what was going on sort of thing. And anyway, we we was, it was all going on smoothly. I told four or five boys, I always like to tell the players early who are not getting contracts the next year to help them out to get a club for the following season. Some managers don't do it. I always do it for a simple reason. It's like you coming to me in the middle of June and going, why didn't you tell me earlier? I could have got myself fixed up. And I'd done it with a couple of the players who did get fixed up. I told a few of the lads that they weren't getting contracts. But not only were these lads that I was telling weren't getting contracts, they was very, very disruptive, some of them, around the club as well. So I said, you're not getting contracts? Okay, all right, thanks. We was helping them get out on loan. We was helping them do all the things. Erdan, who was the, the uh, Turkish CEO, was doing it in charge of a lot of them because he knew their agents. So we're sitting there and we're up at, we went to Mansfield, Never forget it. We're four games towards the end of the season. Now, the Americans are in by now. They sold the club on the 7th of April. Um, and the Turks, um, yeah, some April. This was like the 22nd of April. We're up at Mansfield. Nigel Clough signed. Good side. You know, you've got to be up there. You've got to be prepared. I had just signed these eight boys on long-term con- or two-year contracts, the ones that I wanted, the core of the, the, the players. So I knew that we got a great chance. So we've gone up there. So at five o'clock, the coaches pulled up, all the lads, all up in the rooms, boom, boom, boom. We had a, a Zoom meeting with the Americans at eight o'clock to welcome the new contract players, that, you know, I five them and on the Zoom. So anyway, five o'clock, I then get a phone call from our secretary and they said, John, there's, um, got to tell you, nothing to worry about, but there's some allegations been made against you. So I said, oh yeah, well, what have I done now then? And I'm still thinking it's the, the, the bloody from the podcast and whatever, whatever you call them, like the interview things. So they said, she said, no, don't worry about it. I had a call from the FA, but there's some people made allegations against you. I said, well, for what? And then she went, well, a racial allegation. I went, oh. I said, all right. And I named four of the players. I said, right, I'll, t- I'll tell you where they are because now they've got the ump because they're not getting a contract. I said, phone the FA up there, sick, and he told me exactly the same. He said, don't worry about anything, John. This happens all the time. As you know, this time of the year in football, just got to give you the heads up because someone's leaked it from the FA to the press. So I said, well, is that allowed then? I said, can I speak to... No one spoke to me, so I don't know who's been told this, who said this, who said that. He said, well, I'm sorry, John. He said, but someone's leaked it. It's been leaked. So I said, okay, right. So I phoned my wife up and said, like, pick the problem. I'm still thinking it's like, you know, like a bloody someone selling a car or something. In there. I, I called all the lads in, like the, the, the black players I had with me. Lewis, my assistant at the time was Lewis Young, who's Ashley Young's brother, who is black, right? Lewis, top kid, earned his badges. We put him through his badges when he was with us. I called in a couple of the other black ladies that was in the team. I said, right, because I'm they're saying to me it's players in the team. So I said, well, what's, what's up with you lot? What are you talking about? I said, well, who's put the allegations in? What are you talking about? So straight away, they've said, well, we know, hold on, I know what's happened. Boom, boom, boom. There are a few quid or you've told them that they're leaving. Uh, right, Okay. None of us, right, everyone's a bit sad and that, right, go, let's go. Keep going. Eight o'clock, we met the Americans, hey, boys, let's have a good season, let's go, let's do this, let's do that. Okay, so I'm thinking, well, it ain't that bad, it's nothing, as I've been told, don't worry about it. 20 past one that morning, I get a phone call from America. John, um, 
had some news here. Um, don't take the game tomorrow. It was 20 past one. What? Hello? Who's this sort of thing? You know, I thought he was one of the lads winding me up. Because Lynch, he was terrible like that. Joel Lynch, he was fucking... And, and I thought it was him. So I said, Lynch, and he went, no, he said, seriously, he said, you don't want you at the game. We can't have racism at the football club. I said, what, what are you talking about? And all of a sudden, this American gets on. He said, Johnny, pack your shit and fuck off. And I, of course, I, I said, I beg your pardon. <laughs> well, I didn't. I said, you know what I'm saying? And I went, are you fucking serious? What are you talking about? This article's going to appear in the paper tomorrow. Blah. I said, how do you know? How do you know? Because I don't. I don't know what's going to appear. Anyway, long and short of it, I've had to wake the staff up to tell them that I've got to leave the hotel. This was by two o'clock now. So the Americans have told me to pack my gear and fuck off after the success we've had. And yeah, I five in at eight o'clock to now being told, see you later. So I've, I've got all the lads up early for breakfast, nine o'clock. Two of them, three of them wanted to come home with me, didn't want to play because they knew that the lads that had said things, it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't right, put it that way. Even though no one had knew what they'd said, they knew what was going on. This is football. So there I am. Lewis Young had to drive me to the station. The goalkeeping coach had to pay my ticket. Um, one of the sponsors had to meet me at the train station because there was there was fans uh, around my car at, at Crawley, and people didn't. They was all supporting me, by the way. They weren't sort of like having a pot, but I didn't know. I go, what, what the fuck's going on? Half past six, BBC Radio. Whatever it is, is on the phone. John, can we have a word? I said, of course you can. I think they're talking about the game. And they said, uh, uh, allegations of racial, you segregate, I oh, know you, you've done this, this relegation, uh, segregation. No, they didn't say the segregation charge. That was the week later. Allegations of, of, of racial to talk to these players and um, Nick the Boobalhead. Nick the Boobalhead of Greek origin. This, that, and all I'm going, uh, no, Nick the Boobalhead, what are you talking about? Never heard of Boobalhead. Right? It's an American word. It's mean a, a Boobalhead is a bobblehead. It's a little thing that they have out there. Anyway, my missus phoned up. I said to her, What's, she went, everyone's been on the phone, blah, blah, blah. Next thing, in the Daily Mail, fucking hell, what their arm up, like, fucking, what's going on? I'm fucking Genghis Khan all of a sudden. I've done this, I've done this, I've done that, I've done that. Okay, all right. So uh, what, what, I phoned up the LMA, it's a solicitor, and she's, and I'm, I'll never forget Lindsay, bless her. I said, well, Lindsay, I said, I said I'm really worried about this. I said, they ran me house. What's going on? All my mates phoned me up. Who is it? Who the fuck is it? Listen, you want to, no, 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 don't be stupid. And, she's, and I said, what's up? So she, she said, uh, well, look, anyway, she said, look, let's sort it out Monday. I said, Lindsay, I'm on a train now going home. She said, what do you mean you're on a train? I said, they've told me to fuck off and get home. She said, I can't do that. Contract, you know. I said, well, listen, Lindsay, I've got my Crawley tracksuit on. Now have a talk about dark humour and that. There's a couple of Nottingham Forest supporters on the train going down. And I'm sitting there, my fucking head's gone. Are you all right? My head's gone. I'm all over the place. And it's not in a forest fan, big fucking lump. I went, oh no. He looked at me, went, I hope the stags win today, mate. And I went, who? And he went, the stags, Mansfield. He said, I hope they beat you a lot today. I said, join the fucking club, mate. And he looked at me and he went, Are you the geezer that was in the boat? Oh, you're the one who's in. I went, fuck me, it's on the news as well. And I'm going, what's going on? I'm walking around, you know, who am I? For one minute, there I am, we're going to win the league and beat... Anyway, long story, got home, got picked up by by this, by this one of the sponsors, mate, and some of the things that were being bandied about that I was accused of, fucking hold on a minute. Some I didn't know. I generally did not know what was going on. Generally, or hand on art, whatever you want to call it. I ain't... You listen... I ain't there to upset anybody or, or to do anything. I was worried about getting the best team out on the pitch for that football club. Treat everybody the same, in my opinion. Right. Monday's come. Like the, the, the Sunday, oh, bang, the balloon's gone up. Monday, the LMA were doing what we can do and the Americans are doing. You can imagine it. Not doing the game. I thought I'd be back doing the game. We played Saturn on the Tuesday. All the fans are 
protesting to bring me back and all these sorts of things. Because they know, that, you know, following what there I am, fucking Sky TV, um, two days stuck outside my house. Microphones, cameras. I've been done for segregating a changing room. Won't let blacks change with whites. Won't let blacks eat with whites. Won't let... I said, what the fuck are you talking about? I've come back from the gym, jolly, waiting to go on my holidays, jolly, you know. All these things as then, two days. Followed my missus, my missus worked in the hospital, called the hospital, uh, Horsham Hospital. And I'm, my head's just, you can imagine it. What have I done? I still generally, still genuinely did not know, not one person told me. Couldn't get contact with the FA. Couldn't get contact, you know, the LMA was being really good. The club didn't want to know. Club didn't even back me. The club didn't even. I haven't spoke to nobody from the club since then about it. You know, and you sign these disclaimer things that you're not allowed to say this and say that. But there was nobody. That, who do I turn to? So I've got good supporters like, you know, Keith and that who used to be one of the sponsors there, and, and Frakey and them. They was good to me. They helped me. They sort of like knew the injustice of it because they come at the games. They've seen the atmosphere at the club. The players are phoning me up. Oh, what's happening? Blah blah blah. Lewis, go. What's going on? What's I said, Lewis, I don't know. All of a sudden, Sky Sports, Sky News, Sky everything else. I've done this, I've done that, I've done everything else. What are you, 28 charges or something? You were 28 charges. I said, yeah, listen, it, still me being silly me. Well, they're going to know that it's all bullshit anyway. You know, it's from players that I've released, obvious. Still not knowing who the players were officially. And of course, from there, fuck, I mean, it was like a tenement coming down. So see, when you got, many charges did you actually get? I think there was, originally, there was 28 because... That's a lot of charges. Over. Massive, One or two, you're thinking, you've got a fighting chance. There you go. So who leaked the stories to the papers? Do you Nobody ever know? still knows. <clears throat> Nobody knows. And the fellow that wrote it in the paper, who, um, a fellow called Matt Hughes from the Daily Mail, um, who I phoned up and he wouldn't tell me who it was, um... Anyway, they'd done quite a few other stories of Daily Mail and they was getting their information from somewhere that was totally contradicting everything. You know, as as the year went on, the contradictoriness of all the, all the charges and all the stories just didn't, didn't, you know, link up. So I'm waiting to go again, I'm going on my holidays and these charges are just growing and growing and growing and people are going, fucking hell, it's... It, it, Stupid, stupid statement. It was just like when the Jimmy Savile thing blew. He started off with one, then I'm thinking, fucking hell, what's all this going on? Generally now, I'm thinking, going up me nut, going, what have I done? I know my mates are funny. I'm going, there ain't no fucking notes. It's all right, but you don't take no notice. You ain't got press sitting outside your door. You ain't got them following your missus to work. You know, my boys fucking fume. Everybody's sort of like in my street, in my cul-de-sac thing. And, uh, from there, it, the club never heard anyone from the club. The club paid me off and they never sacked me. I, I then picked the paper up. John Yem sacked for racism. Um, racist, we can't have racists at the football club. Quote, so and so, so and so. You phone up and go, well, I'm not racist. What are you telling me I'm racist? These are accusations. They're not, they're not done deals. They're accusations. Right. John Yem's sacked from calling never sacked I'm never one never sacked it was an untenable workplace which you know you can't talk about the deal and all that but it was uh, what do I do I don't want to leave the club we're, we're going to get promoted oh okay not a mention from the club not a mention but three weeks later I then get a call up the FA I've got to go and make a statement to the FA and you walk in there and I'm not being funny it was like you're going in the old Bailey but it's not, it's not by law. You're, you're, it's by the FA rules. It's not a court of law. So it's not criminal charges? No. So everybody going, I'm racist, I'm, oh, you're racist, you're this, you're that. No, you're not. Let's prove it. Let's just see what we've got to do. So I go through my statement and I listed the four boys that I thought would make the statements um, and they wouldn't tell me. And then at the end, they, they, I knew. I said, there you go. I, I, you know, some of the accusations. And, and I told them I started straight from the bat, I never changed one bit of my statement from day one. Um, there was the there was no witnesses. The only witness that come out of sixty, 
I think Erdan, the, the CEO, said there's 100 employees, including all the stewards and all that. How many statements was taken off of them, under, including the players, the staff and everything? How many statements was taken, would you say? You're doing an investigation. I'm not sure. None. The only statements that were taken was from the boys that made the accusations and the club chaplain came forward. There were six people. Not one player was asked. They're still waiting for the PFA to turn up. They're still waiting for the FA to turn up to question the players. So see, because it's nearly 30 accusations, as a lot. So see the the, the, the owners, uh, Crawley, can you understand, well, wait a minute, they don't want racism in the club, Massively. or do you think they threw you under the brush? Like, how do you, totally how do you see it? I, I, I listen, they're new owners in the club, but let's let's put it in a nutshell. This is, this is the Johnny M's world. They, they put forward all these allegations a day after the club was sold. So you've got new owners that are reading these new... Now, whether they knew about these allegations, one, why did they wait and why didn't they do an investigation? Because the club never interviewed anybody. The club never asked anybody anything. Never asked me anything. They, they then phoned me up and asked me 10 questions. It was like mastermind sort of thing. And I thought, play the game, I was you want to get your money. And I'm still waiting for the investigation. I'm waiting for Lee to be questioned. I'm waiting for Lewis to be questioned. I'm waiting for the physios to be questioned. I'm waiting for the fitness coach to be questioned. I'm waiting for the players to be questioned. And they will tell you that all this is a lot of bollocks. Right, that didn't happen. So the club, in its wisdom, I understand a little bit where they was coming from, but I, wouldn't, I would have thought the club would have backed me being a manager until you've done an investigation. Logic or not, I don't know. But, you know, the season was ending. Now, we only had three weeks before the end of the season, so this was all going through the summer. But once that racism card gets played, you'd Look, have seen family members and friends oh, kind of questioning it and thinking they can lose their careers. People lose their livelihood. Massively, mate, massively. And But what you don't see, you don't see me on the other side who, who's going through it all. You're sitting there going, well, I can, I can understand everybody. I felt sorry for the players. The players was phoning me. Players were fantastic with it all. The owners, the old owners was phoning me. Supporters was phoning me. We've known you years, you wouldn't do this. And in the end, I, 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 once again, my nut had gone. I was under the psychiatrist with the FA, uh, LMA um, for a little while. Um, still thinking it's all going to resolve itself. Um, I think <laughs> we do these, these so-called interviews um, with the FA, which I've done. And then they're talking about, do you know this this pre? And yeah, 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 I know everybody, yeah. But I'm still not bother, not admitting to anything because I don't know what to admit to. You're telling me all these things. We then have a trial. It's a trial, like right? They appoint three people. It's not a trial, it's an inquiry. Because once again, it's not against the law. All these things are against me, and, and yet there's not one legal, one legal challenge. So the coppers were never involved? No, but there's another thing, because... Uh, Crawley got a little bit in trouble. They put a statement out once that the police told them to drop the charges, blah, blah, blah. And the police turned around and said, there's nothing to be charged with, didn't, nothing of the sort. There's no charges as far as we're concerned. There's nothing there. There's, you know, and I knew a couple of coppers and I'd done a little bit of homework with people I know. And uh, there's nothing. There's no, where's the evidence? You know, it's hearsay. All these charges was based on hearsay. Their word against yours. Your word against mine. But there's five of them, remember. So I yeah, went. You're fucked. Then, you're fucked. Yeah. You're fucked. But it sounds a lot of charges. But if but <laughs> the three or four of them, if they all do a ch like four charges each, well, straight away you're you're on twenty charges, aren't you? So it, it's still not in my head. I'm still not ringing true. So I've got people, good people in the game, giving me references to take to the FA. But well, when are you going to come and talk to the players? When are you going to interview? When we get to this trial. And to my knowledge, and I've got all the statements as I've showed you this morning, I've showed you all the legal evidence, there's not one person that's been interviewed. Well, how could this one be fair? And most importantly of all, what, what, what is your uh, intention? What's your narrative? What are you trying to do? I had the, the, the um, people in... That's what gave me the ump more than anything, and it happened afterwards. When you get these people so-called pundits and people writing in the press, black players, oh, you should be doing it. You know, I don't want to, it's not a black and white thing for me. It was just, it was just these players, if that makes sense. Because I still don't know what they are. 
this man should be banned from football. This man should be thrown off. You know, this man should be sent to Mars. This man should be... You don't know me. What are you saying? You, you know me. You don't even know the players. You just know that they've said these things that it's got to still be tried with. Right, so we then go through the trial, or through the inquiry, and some of the things that... I, when I got the statements and I was alleged to have said and what I got tried with, mate, was... I'm sitting here thinking, this is a fucking wind-up. You know, prime example, two players was playing darts, two black players was allegedly playing darts. And I've gone up to, now one of the black players said there was just two of them playing darts. Brilliant. I've gone up to them and said, what you two throwing the darts for, you should be blowing them, they blow darts. Right? The other person who was playing darts with him turned around and said, we was playing darts and there was, he, he named five players that was watching them play. So one of them says there was nobody there. The other one says there were six of them there. So my natural reaction is, when I was reading it, well, go and ask one of the six players that was there if it happened. Didn't ask anyone. Why? I don't know. They still charge me. I, I said, have you seen the film Terminator? Yeah. Do you know the actor in it, um, Arnold? That's what I I got charged for that as well. I emphasized the N-word in his name. The second, the second name. Second name. And that, once again, but it wasn't by the people I was talking to. This was by people that was listening into the conversations. I then get accused of saying to two lads, do you go fishing? No, we don't go fishing, Gaffer. Is that because you stab all the fish? What? Next question, follow-up question in the book was, did, did he mean that all black people stab things? Yes, that's what he meant. Right, so the other fella that were, the other one that was one who was fishing, the other one who was fishing, the other witness then turns around and says, Yeah, I oh, sorry, they had a witness, all the same people, the same five, they're the old witnesses. Yeah, I was there, I heard it, I heard the gaffer say, You stab all the frogs. Well done, he said fish, he said frog. The intention was you said that they stab things. This isn't like me being a court of what are you talking about? I stabbed things. That's a charge, right? When you're not playing, when you're not playing at a football club, if you're, if you're segregated from the team, segregation, never heard the word before in my life, segregation, heard it, but always in America. I segregate the changing rooms. Got dropped. All the charges against me wouldn't let blacks do this with whites. and wouldn't let. They dropped all them because the lads, I think it may have been Lynchy, I'm not sure. One of the lads has phoned up and said, this is all bollocks. All bollocks this. So they drop the charges, right? Not an apology. That don't go in the paper and say, hold on, these lads lied about that charge. It didn't happen. Sky don't come round. My, when, when I got done the other week about apologising, when I said I want an apology, it wasn't I want an apology. They cut it a little bit. I don't want an apology. My wife, my family, my friends do, that you've sent Sky TV round my house on allegations that have been thrown out of water. Do I get an apology? No. By this time, my head's, you know, squiddly diddly like. So I'm, I'm going all through this trial and there's these, these things going on. You then get called saying someone, I admitted to four of them, I think, which was jokes. One of them, one of the lads after the game, we beat Swindon and the Indian lad was sitting there and uh, he said, uh, I, I went up to him, he's sitting there with a face like a smack dust. Now we're sponsored by Domino's Pizzas. Remember this, every game, we get pizzas delivered every game. And I'm sitting there, and he's sitting there all miserable. I said, what's the matter with you? No curry pizzas, right? Because they're, they're something they have all different. Fucking, I'm doing the press, I'm buzzing. All of a sudden, that's offensive to him, you know. Well, if it is, well, okay, say something and forget it sort of thing, you know. But I didn't sort of like purposely go out and say, curry pizza, well, what are you upset about? All the other, oh, you know, players are like, oh, gaffer, fucking. We just won. We just beat Swindon, top of the league side. That's another charge. And I'm going, listen, I don't know what I'm going to say. The Football League then tell me, the, the fella said, Mr. Yems, your language and your outlook is in the past. Uh, your London history or this, your, you know, your background, blah, blah, blah. It's sort of things that has got to be forgotten now. You shouldn't be talking like this or thinking like that. And I said, well, listen, I'm, I'm very, very sorry about that, but I'm brought up the way that I was brought up. I've not said, never been, never will be 
racist about anything intentionally. Never in a million, million years. And I'm proud to come from South London. I'm proud to be what I am. And that's me done. I'm sorry, but that's the way I am. Okay, so you think that... What was the another? There was another... Cro- oh, yeah. I was accused of, of, of saying to... Well, not accused. We got a player, a Greek player, Nick the Bubble. Right? You can't call him Nick the Bubble. If you ask them, why is that? Because Nick was in the paper. His name was in the paper through being aggressive. I was taking the mick out of his Greek heritage and his Greek roots and his Greek this and Greek that. I sit and Greek dancing. I was doing Greek dancing at the training ground. And I'm thinking, okay, what do you think? I'm Demis Roussoff, so you know what I mean? What, what? Nick never said a word. He phoned me out practically crying. Gaff, I give him his chance. I signed him. Gaffer, I didn't say, didn't do this. Didn't, and yet it's in the paper, so people believed it. His mum and dad and his agent were trying their best to get, to get whoever told the story to sue him. See, when you're at the inquiry, but why was the players and nobody backing you then? Could they not get called as witnesses or anything? Nothing. You couldn't. So because, it's not like a court where people can go and yeah. fight your corner? Oh, you can. So why if, didn't you have them there? Yeah, because, see, that, I'm glad you said that. Because if I'm disagreeing, if I'm saying it didn't happen... How can I then get people to come along and say, James, do us a favour. You know the other day, these two are saying that I, that I stabbed fishes. Can you come and say I didn't say that? And you come up and say, well, he didn't say that. Well, then I've already said it didn't happen. So now you're lying. You're just backing me through saying it, it didn't happen. But could you not have got references from Got them all. Got players them. you'd worked through the years to say that he ain't a racist? <laughs> got them. What is a racist to you? Racist to me... To, it's changed over the years. What I know now, and what it is, I, I think that if you discriminate against anybody through colour, sexual orientation, wherever they're from, if you, if you, if I'm stopping you doing something because you're different to me, then to me I'm a racist. Maybe that's very naive on my point of view, but that's the way that I look at it. I would not do anything that would upset you through your creed, colour, religion, anything like that. Never. In, I want you to be one of us because I need you playing for the football team. Don't care. We had, we had black players playing for me. Why didn't they interview the black players that was playing for me if I was such a bastard? None of them come forward against me. So you admitted to four and they done yeah. you for 11? 11 in the end. But these are the 11, are oh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Je- oh, getting back to the Dulwich Hamlet days. Sorry if I'm waffling on with this because it just sends you to the moon. Um, Dulwich Hamlet. When we was at Dulwich Hamlet, when I played there, there used to be a little chicken shop in Peckham Rye. Right, where the boys used to go after the game, have a bit of jerk chicken, have a bit of curry, whatever they was eating. As it went on, we went back when Crouchy and that was there. I'm not saying Crouchy went there, by the way. The lads, some of the black lads again from Peckham, from the area, used to go to the chicken shop having a bit of jerk chicken and everything. Right, brilliant. When I first went to the club, there was a player there that had played for Dulwich Emlet. So I, and this other fella who was the, he is the shit stirrer amongst it all. Um, this, this fellow said to him, oh, when you was there, did you used to use the jerk chicken shop in Peckham? Nah, I can't have all that. I said, oh, fucking good food, that. I said, I used to eat a bit of it. What it was, this place used to be open practically all night, when we, even when we was kids, and you'd go to get a bag of chips, do what you got to do. And I said to the man, did you eat? No, 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 I don't eat all that. I said, fucking good for you, a bit of jerk chicken, woo, 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 you know, like just as you did. I then get accused of mentioning a Caribbean food to a black player who's not from the Caribbean. So I've got Nick for mentioning jerk chicken to put her because I mention it because of their colour. Nothing to do with their colour. The jerk chicken was a reference for playing for Dulwich Hamlet, which the boy did. Right? When he left, I never mentioned jerk chicken again because I know the others didn't play for Dulwich Hamlet. And yet that's a charge. When you see the, ch- you know, in press, food, Caribbean, jerk j- chicken, um, Stabbing fish, blah, blah, blah. I'm looking at it thinking, I didn't say half of this. Yes, the jerk chicken, I did say. But I'm telling you how I said it. I did say Arnold Schwarzenegger. I've said it again, Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's not me, what's the word, trying to be racist with it. It's the name. Do you know a lot of the stuff that you've said has been took out of context? Oh, and spent? context is, is listen, I... I, I <laughs> I, I went all through this trial. The, the actual first panel, who had a KC, who obviously the high, one of the highest you can get in, in, the, in the law profession, 
I had an ex-professional footballer, Tony Agana, played the lead, and there was a secretary of Wolverhampton Wanderers who was there as well, who was the panel. So my, as we're going through it, now these boys as well, remember the boys that I released was the sh- shock horror, was the same boys that made the statements that I'd released them. These boys have been banned from the club for numerous things as well. We had a friendly, just to give you a little bit of a background on the lads as well, we had a friendly at Three Bridges where we was playing Reading, I think we was. My mate, it was a, he worked at the train station at Three Bridges, gets a phone call. Mate, don't want to worry, you had the old bill after a couple of your lads. What, what, what's gone on? He said, they've just jumped over the train barrier with their tracksuits on and there was a passenger that got pushed. Oh, fucking hell. And it's a nick, it's a big nick. Right, Okay. Boys come running up the road. I said, right, you, you, and you, fuck up, mum. Don't want you here. What, you, what, what, what? Fucking what? What do you mean, what? One of them argued to the cows come over. Took him down, see, my mates didn't call the police. CCTV, there they are, jumping over the barriers. Wouldn't admit to it. So I said, there you are. Now, fuck off, because you're going to get nicked. Right, okay. So you do them a favour with that. You get the same two of the boys sitting. All this is documented. It's not me making it up. Two boys sitting in the stand taking the piss out of one of their teammates, right, who was a black player. These two lads are, 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 um, are, are the two lads that, as well that are got suspended. Uh, taking the piss out of one of our players playing, the captain and, and, and another lad come up to me and said, Gaffy, you've got to sort these out. These are causing fucking murders. So, right, get in the office, blah, blah, blah. One of them's threatened to shoot me giving it all the gun signs outside and all that. I said, you can fucking do what? Boom, boom, boom. Now, luckily, luckily that the CEO was there, Erdan, and Lee Bradbury come out and pulled me in, and these two are fucking, we're going to fuck you up, we're going to fuck you up and all that. We put them out on loan straight away. Ain't done bad, have they? That's all I'm saying. Two of them have come back and fucked me up. So the ones who was threatening to shoot you... Oh, yeah, doing all the guns. Is the yeah. one who's made the allegations against yeah, you? Yeah, both of them. And this yeah. is noted down, it's not just you. No. Try to Read fire it. shots back. Read it. So <laughs> when you're then sitting in court and getting you admitted to four things, the FA have charged you 11, what happened then? Well, you go, you go, what happens? You go through this process, four and a half days. And like you say, it's not like, the, the boys have to come up and give evidence and you've got kick racism or kick it out football and you've got this other people uh, and I'm on the phone to my psychiatrist obviously I'd gone by then I, I, my head had just fucking you keep my, saying your head's gone with you you, oh, you mate, suicidal oh, well, I wasn't that bad I just wanted it to end because I'm going home to my wife and kids not so much to my boy and that but I'm going home I'm looking at you now as a friend thinking you think I'm fucking racist you know I'm not but back of your mind you're going you dirty bastard. I didn't... F- I, I just... I couldn't trust anyone. I was looking at people. Four death threats I got. Police had to come around four times. Not mentioned about that. Um, not that, that, that... I wasn't too concerned about that, to be honest, because the, the fella, the police couldn't find the fella that was doing it, but put it this way, he was found and uh, he admitted doing it. But the the police, I'm saying four death threats, not not a mention, not no help at all from anybody. The LMA was good, but not a help. You know, I'll, I'll keep hearing about these boys' mental health, and all, which listen, I totally agree with. If it was doing them harm, I, you know, I, I can't. Me, not a mention, not a jot of how I was doing, or how you coming home and you see your missus in tears some nights waiting for it all to end. You Remember, I'm not at work. Remember, I can't work for anybody. You know, there's people letting me out, come and do this, come and do that. But I, didn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't face anybody. I could not face. And when, when I was getting a few of the black lads phoning me and, and wishing me, all, you know, that, that used to perk you up because a lot of the players was being different class. Gaffer, we know it ain't true. The truth had come out and all this sort of thing. Hence me coming on something like this because nobody, nobody at the time wanted to talk to me. Nobody would listen to my side of it. Nobody would even, you know, how can you not take, how can you not speak to the players? How can you not speak to the staff that was there with me? Trace, Regardless. It's racism. So once it's there, everybody's too scared. There you go. Everybody's, again, I spoke earlier, has got the cancel culture. If people are batting you, they're the racist. Well, of course. 
course. But they can, they can then, at least, James, they can turn around and say, well, these allegations. But when you've then got the picture of the boys that are saying it, and don't get me wrong, I ain't too bl- I'm not blaming the lads too much. It's the process that went on straight away from making the allegations to having it in the newspaper and on the TV within a day without anyone asking me, without any, any support behind the allegations, boom, it's in the press. So you, you, you're free nil down away from home before you kick a ball, wouldn't you? So everything that you went through then with that, like, when did you get the 18-month ban? How long after? Well, that was it. You, you wait. It was January, and my barrister was really good. And, it, and, and I'm, I'm going... Oh. So you need a barrister? A barrister? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You've got a barrister, you've got a solicitor. But they make you laugh, and I don't mean it's to, well, if it's disrespectful that way, I don't care. But you're there. It's supposed to be a court of law, and it's not a court of law. Remember, all these against their rules. Nothing in out in the street. Out in the street wouldn't stand up, right? I've been told because you do need witnesses and you do need statements. Well, go and do it if you if you think I'm that bad. Why didn't you do that in the first place? You know, why, why, why have you, you've suddenly come back after saying you was going to fuck me up, you've done a good job on it. So anyway, so you wait and then about, I don't know, two, three weeks later, I'll get the call. John's got to tell you, they've banned you for 18 months, but good news, they found you not to be racist, did not use this uh, racist language with intent, and you didn't lie because they check your statements from day one to see whether you've made any... Change as it. it goes through. I never changed it. Never changed the names. Never changed anything. Right. Wallop. The press came down. This is fuck it. This is wrong. They accused the FA and the press of accused the FA's panel of being racist. Right. Well, the referent that the panel's now racist. You've got everybody, and I, I'm now being burnt at the stake because. I've got, a, there was one headline, I've got to get out of jail free card. Well, get out of jail free card? I've got 18 months of no money, banned. Death and threats. De- death threats. Mrs. going do lally, you know. Bless her, it's not the best, the best of time. But, <laughs> and all that going on, you know, you don't know what's going on. You can't, people, great people like Keith and, and everyone else backing you. And people wouldn't, my, my, where I'm from, Everybody was backing me. If I was wrong, they'd be the first to tell me what a fucking Joey I am. They wouldn't have it, you know, and from all walks of life. They knew, they've known me for 30 odd years not to get one, not one accusation to suddenly get 20 thrown at you through four people that you'd release from the football club. Does it make sense? I don't know. Get the 18 months, I'm sitting there thinking, oh no. My barrister phones me up. Got some bad news. I said, go on, don't tell me. It's 20 months or something. Because he's, uh, he's saying to me, they can't tell. So I'm not racist. They can't find me racist. And that's when they was on about old-fashioned language. At the time, Prince Harry was on the, uh, I think it was Harry, talking about the royal family being conscious racist. Well, all of a sudden, I'm now a conscious racist. What the fuck? I don't, tell me, I don't know what, you know, explain to me. Don't label me with all these things. So then, obviously, it comes to this. A day late, the FA, they was a day outside of their terms of appealing against the decision of 18 months. So I said, but how can you appeal against your own panel? It was an independent panel. It's independent means cut or dry, good or bad, win or lose. Uh, no, it's not like that. Well, where is it then? Well, we think that they this, this and this and da di da di da Fuck me. Well, what, what's the, my barrister's guy? My barrister was absolutely fuming with it. Never been heard of, never been done, never been done before. So I've been told. And I'm, I'm going, well, what does that mean with me then? So they said, well, there's another trial. Uh, another inquiry. You can't call it a trial because it's not legal. But you can call it an inquiry until, it, until the result comes and then you're guilty. So anyway, so I, I fucking... I've gone all through this and once again, you think you've settled and then voila. And Sporting Chance, Keith contacted the Sporting Chance for me. Tony Adams is his company. Oh. Mate, they have been fantastic. You got am I? Oh, yeah, They've got fantastic, been fantastic, helping me. They've seen what it's been like in the press and they've seen they've made no they're not judgmental, they're not making any judges you did, you didn't. 
but all they get to know you with, and and I think I'm on my fifteenth less fifteenth. Uh, you know, the fellow he phones me every every day, and they've been uh, every day every week. They've been really really good because they've helped. I didn't realise how, how much it was it affecting me. I was driving around my car at one two o'clock in the morning sometime. What the fuck am I doing here? Why am I wasting my time? Why am I why am I being accused of all these things? Yes, I like a laugh. Yes, I like. Did I intentionally set out to maliciously ruin or, or talk about anybody? No. No. And you could but you could I, I even offered to sit in a room with the FA with with the kick races amount with them all. Put me in a room and let's just see what I did and didn't do. And you can I went on the courses. I went on the FA course. I've done all that. Done it all. Yeah, education courses. I never realised that you couldn't say coloured anymore. Didn't realise. 30 years it's been banned. <sighs> massive. It's massive. They said to me in the trial, you use the word coloured a lot. You know it's been banned. No, I don't. You should know. Yeah, I don't. Well, you should do. It's your right. Read my statements in there. And you've got a couple of the lads that are making the statements calling them, calling coloured players. They're using the word coloured in there. When we was growing up, you couldn't say black. Black was all, fucking, I can't say that. You've got yeah. to be coloured. Obviously, if, as things progress and, and it's can understand that how people come right down on it because people do get affected by it. Some people don't. Like, you clearly like a laugh. You've clearly said things out of fucking yeah, jest yeah. and making jokes and not thinking it's affecting people. But the bottom line is, it does affect people. Massively. And I'll, and I'll hold my hands up on that. And this is what I've said to the FA. Okay, I've done some things. But the things I've admitted to, but as for the other stuff, it's bullshit. Now tell me, tell me what I've done, or, or, or so, so anyway. So we then, and then I get a phone call. You've got three years, a three-year ban from football in the whole of the UK. I cannot go and do an under-11 side in for three years. Three years. Justify a bit. Why? Why have you gone against your own panel? that you've said was independent, that I, I was prepared to come and speak to, you then didn't like their decision, so it's not independent anymore, is it? They're saying what you want them to say. Yes, but it's the rules. We, well, hold on, it's the rules because it's your gentleman's club. Now, if that is the rules, so be it. But I'd, I'd have a question, and I think there is a lot of changes that they're talking about because... You, you've been found not guilty, and to, I'll take your point, 100%, 150 million percent. But the other side of that is, if people are making these accusations and they've got no evidence of making them, it's a two-way street. Because how do they think I feel? How do they think that they've made these allegations? Four things I admitted to, which was laughs and jokes, but that was all with the players. The players, it wasn't the players that I was joking with that made the accusations, it's other people listening. So were they, and it's over two and a half years, James. It's not like that within a month. It's two and a half years. Not one report to the CEO. Not one report to Lewis or, or to Bradders, like where they can go and say, look, I think the gaffer said this, blah, blah, blah. Not one report to the club secretary. Not one report to the FA. Not one report to the PFA. And all of a sudden, you get 20 of them come at you. On the same day, same week? Same day, same week. So... <laughs> the three years you were there, there was not a case there. There was one every oh, yeah. couple of months, and they've, yeah. they've tallied up and says like there's tallied a problem. Up. So there people's actually just gave all the accusations in one day. One day, they've all come at one. Oh, so I'm saying, do you feel yeah. as if it's been planned then? Oh, massively, massively. It's it's too coincidental. It's too. It, from my point of view, if if you're looking at it and you don't need to be Sherlock Holmes to see that the new owners come in the club. You then get all these accusations against me, whether they're just, whether they're not. Why save them all up to a day that the new owners come in? Why then suddenly get me the sack, which then, well, it wasn't the sack. It was, um, why get me like you have done? I don't honestly think the lads realised, uh, my gut, knowing them, I signed two of the boys. I paid money for one of them. One of them, or well, two of them, are good players. They shouldn't be, you know, I, I faint, I backed them. The chairman didn't want to see... You'll see the chairman's statement soon. He's doing a statement, the owner's on it. Because I've waited this time and, and nobody's give me the opportunities. They keep saying to me, apologise, apologise. For what? Tell me, you know, if, if the four things that I've done, that I've admitted to, if I upset people in between that, I wish you would have let me know. And of course, I, I wouldn't want anybody to, you know. But other than the four there, mate, 
come on, let's let. I've got the statements here. I've got the trial. I've got everything here. Come and read them, and then just tell me what you think. Just tell me, as as a body of people, what you think. I'm ha- listen, like I say, I'm happy to give anybody a voice to, yeah, to ha- yeah. have their corner and fight their say. I would happy sit with you and one of the boys or four of the boys yeah. and have a discussion that I'm open to do so mm-hmm. see what happens with your interview with TalkSport um, I was t- Simon Jordan stuck up for me when it first happened and I vaguely knew Simon because I worked at Palace um, I, I'm telling lies I didn't know Simon people I knew knew Simon he was the chairman when I was there and and they said look you give me the opportunity to come on and Jim phoned me up and he said I'll give you the opportunity to, uh, Simon and the day that I spoke to him, I'd, I'd, oh, <laughs> I'd also received two writs from these players that are trying to sue me personally after all this happened. So every time you open a letter, he's now trying to take me to court. Fuck me, when's this going to end? Well, one of them's dropped the charges anyway. Um, that day that we opened the, the thing, people don't see all that. Now, in the, in the, every time we was getting a letter, me and my missus were going, what the fuck has happened there? You're getting them from the FA, you're getting them from the solicitor, you're getting this. So, Jim, Jim and I went, I've got to tell people my side. I don't care whether people, I do care, because everybody wants to hear the truth. Why don't somebody just listen to what I have to say, take it on face value, take it whatever, it is. if there's truth in it and you believe it, good. If you don't, I can't help that, but this is my side of it. This is what I, I think. As soon as I got on, Jim's first question, John, you're going to apologise? Oh, hello, Jim. Good morning. How are you lot? You're going to apologise? Uh, what, what, what are you talking about? Well, you've been charged. You've been this, you've been that. Like a machine gun at me. Boom, 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 boom. Jim, calm down, you lunatic. What's up you? I said, no, I want an apology. Oh, so you now want it? No, no, no. Like I've just said to you. I want an apology up Skype with my family for this, for that, because they dropped the charges. If I'd sat outside your house and terrorised you and, and really upset all your family and done everything, and I said, yeah, oh, James, sorry, mate, I got it wrong. You go for it, fair enough, that's your job, boom, boom, boom. You wouldn't drive away and then six weeks later print on what a bastard I am, you know, and that's all I was worried about. Not for me, I'm big enough and ugly enough. I thought I was until it starts going up here, but it's your family. You know, surely people can turn around and see that. Oh, but you've had these 12... They're not charges. I didn't do half of what they're saying. I didn't do three quarters of what they're saying. But nobody's interested in that. They've taken everything, everything, as though it's right. Well, why ain't nobody listened to what I've had to say? Why hasn't nobody asked the players? Why hasn't nobody asked us, though? Going back to our same old story, why haven't any of the people been brought forward? It's too late now. It's done. Where do you go forward for the future, John? Um, do you think you'll ever get your career back, especially with those allegations and charges? Yeah. Well, the, the, the thing the thing with it is you can work overseas, and, and let's look at it, maybe I'm kidding myself, but you look at it purely on a football front, and we we were turned it round at Crawley, and, and people were saying what a good side we had. You know, you've produced players, you've worked in football. Yes, sometimes I've got, uh, you know, you go off at the hip and you, and you holler and, hoot and you do what you're doing, but... I, I, I just, I'm just worried about the next, how, how far, if this is what can happen to me without, without really, really, uh, I, I know any racism's bad, anything's bad, this, that and the other. But if there's no sort of like comeback, if you can't defend yourself and every time you get an allegation thrown against you, well, it's got to be true because no one, oh, can't touch that. Well, where, where do we stop? Where's the next thing? Where's the next manager? Where's the next coach? Where's the next player who's going to get bombed, you know, because you can't do this or you can't say that? It, it's it's a frightening world, James. Yeah, well, allegations destroy lives and it's only Massively. allegations that, for me personally, the papers shouldn't be, be able to print anything unless they're charged and convicted, fair enough. Totally unless agree. they can maybe follow the steps and go through the court cases day by day. I get that. I played football for years, for ages of four, many teams. Mm. The fights and the arguments yeah. and the shit that was said was ruthless. But like you say, if you've got the allegations, then you're sitting 30 years in the game. Is it going to go back day one and people coming out and then yes. you're a fucking absolute monster? Yeah. Like, Fair play for coming on today. Listen, it's been the last three years and people can make their own assumptions. Yep. People can w- read the stories and listen to you and then go, do you know what? Yeah, I think yeah. he's all right. He's made a couple of mistakes or I think he's racist. That's down yeah. to them. Down How down are you down. feeling about 
speaking today? No, I was nervous. I was nervous. I'm frightened of because uh, even now, like I've, you know, we've said a couple of things. Um, it, it's just you don't know. You, you don't want to tell lies. You know, there's a there's a great book in it for someone. Um, it, it's it's just the it seems the unfairness of it. And I don't want I don't want people to look at me and go, "Whoa, me!" I don't mean it like that. The unfairness in life that you could be turned around, and, and uh, like you've just said, you summed it up well. There, how this can appear in newspapers, and how it can appear on Sky TVs so, without one allegation at the time being checked. Now they can all be smart asses and go, "Oh yeah," but you know there was even one in there that had credible evidence from the club. Yeah, we've got credible evidence. What credible evidence? Yeah, it's credible evidence or a source or this or there that. There you go. But yeah. nobody wants to come forward. Nobody, it's all right for me defending myself. And like I say to you, everything I've said today, I've got proof of. Everything that I said today um, with the Tony, um, Tony Adams' thing, you know, the sporting chance, been fantastic. It's all there. It's not me coming here just to say, look at me, you know, deflect, deflect. It's not. If I've done something wrong, I'll hold my hands up. As getting back to how we was brought up, you hold your hands up, you do your time, you come out. Right? With this, I don't know what to hold my hands up to. You know, if, if saying Arnold Schwarzenegger's a three-year ban, if saying jerk chicken to somebody, is, do you eat jerk chicken's a three-year ban, but they dress it up, oh, no, no, you know, the FA, you, you said it about this. Don't tell me what I meant it. Don't tell me what context I've said it in. Otherwise, you never leave your bleeding house. And everything you've said today, people people can fact fact check that. Fact just... check if they want to do what they want. Yeah, it's there. Would you like to finish up on anything else, John? Um, no, just uh, as I say, I just talk to yourself. It just brings back all the memories of, of what you've done in the past, and just thanks to all the people that have that I know that have been, you know, supportive of me. And don't matter what race, creed, colour, I've had so many good people. And if and if I've upset the lads that I've done. Or in the future, I didn't mean to do it. John, listen, thanks for coming on today. I Cheers, wish you all mate. the best for the future. Take care. Cheers, James. Thank you.